Hey, Child Development students. So today we are going to continue our work with our Cognitive Development PowerPoint. And I wanted to start off doing a quick summary of yesterday's work because I did have some of you have some questions. So I want to make sure that we, we get those taken care of and you're feeling a little bit better about the notes and what were you supposed to write down and all that kind of stuff. So yesterday your PowerPoint would have started off with this slide. And then it went into talking about how we know some of the things that we know about cognitive development. So for example, observation is a big part of that. Like what we see from kids helps us learn why they're doing the things that they do. And there's much of that com that comes back to cognitive development, how their brain is working and, and why they make the choices they do. And we know through technology and the fact that we have brain scans and things that we can hook up to our heads and actually see the brain doing its job. I mean, there's so much that goes into that, that yeah, that, that gives us a better understanding of cognitive development. And then we had talked before about the idea of how children and any person for that matter, but especially with younger children, they have all of these like network connections that are trying to send messages back and forth. And, and as long as those messages are firing and those, those connections are being exercised, well, then those connections stay open. And that's great because there's opportunities to learn. But then if kids aren't using those connections, that they can then be pruned and they might start to lose that window of opportunity to learn something. So we we know that there's a lot of things out there that can help us better understand cognitive development. And we're going to start to dive into that a little bit more in the next couple of days. But that's just tip of the iceberg for now. Okay, so for your notes, this is what I needed you to write down. Not all of it, three things from this slide, okay? So at the top of your notes, it had, there was a spot that said pretend play. It's the spot that sits just above that. And there's a part that says, page 46 in the textbook, identify three ways you can protect the brain. These are examples of ways that you can protect the brain. So I was wanting you to find three that you like and you know that you can remember for when we do assessments. And yeah, and just kind of better understanding like there are things we legitimately can do to keep the brain safe versus just saying, oh, they have a skull, they're fine. No, 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 no. It goes well beyond bones. There's so many other things that we can do to keep a child's brain protected. Did. So it has better opportunity to learn, grow, and develop. So when you get a chance, just take a look at the slide again if you need to and get three things written down. Okay. All right. And then at the end of yesterday, I'd ask you just take some time to read pass along stories. And can I say thank you so much? Those were so fun to read through. Oh my goodness. I was giggling and chuckling reading through them. I mean, some of the stuff that you guys were coming up with, like, and he likes to eat peaches and oh my gosh, it was cracking me up. So it was, it was super fun to read those. And again, it was a great example of how you were exercising your cognitive development skills, uh, very similar to what some kids do. You're using some of those same connecting pathways to have created your stories. So we will revisit those stories again in the future. Don't think we're done with them because we're not, uh, but we'll, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll reach back to those and, and reference them as the days go on. So now we are getting into our new learning for today. So this is where you'll want to have your notes out. Just a heads up, there is nothing from this slide for you to write down. So just take a deep breath. Okay. So talking about symbolic thought, because this starts to come into cognitive development and you'll see why here in just a second, but symbolic thought is the ability to use symbols to represent objects, actions, or events from a person's world of experiences. So with kids, they're using things to help them make sense of the world around them, to help them complete scenarios of play, if you will. <clears throat> and so things that we would know with kids is that, my examples here, um, preschoolers understand that a card does not just go, but it's used as a means of going someplace. So it's representing this idea of traveling and freedom and going from point A to point B, wherever those might be. And then 
preschoolers can think about some actions without actually having to do them. So a great example would be with some of our toddlers and some of our three-year-olds still too, um, if you were to ask them, hey, what'd you do at recess? If they try to tell you that they were running around the playground, they might actually start running in place because they're trying to tell you, hey, this is what I did. But it also ends up showing up in their body language. Whereas with our preschool age, typically, they're able to use their words to describe to you, this is what I did at recess. So it's just interesting to think about what they do to get across what it is that they're trying to tell us. So, all right, so now we're getting into pretend play. And what I want you to do is I want you to reflect back on when you were younger, what were the kinds of pretend play that you engaged in? What did you pretend play? What were your scenarios? What do you remember doing? And then thinking about what were the things that you had around you that you used to help you do your pretend play? So take a minute or two. Think about what those, those situations were. What did you come up with? What did you play? And I'm sure for some of you, there are definitely some memories coming right to the forefront of, oh my gosh, yeah, I used to play this all the time when I was little. Um, that's great because you obviously were able to, to explore pretend play. So I'm going to pick on this picture here because this child, if we're, if we're looking at the situation, it's very obvious to us that they are going to be making a trip to outer space. <laughs> it sure looks like it. So they have their box, which clearly is representing their spaceship, their rocket ship, whatever comes to their mind. And then it's cool because they took a, a two liter Coca-Cola bottle and they made it into like their jet pack or the rockets to their ship. So it's cool because they're pretend playing the situation of going to outer space and then they're using objects that they would have around their space that they could use to help them do their pretend play. It's not a real rocket ship. It's not a real rocket. Okay, but it's things that are symbolizing those parts so that they can better enact the things that they're trying to do. Okay, so in your notes, this is where you're going to write down a couple words underneath the section that says pretend play. So pretend play is when children use realistic symbols that closely represent intended objects. And then later on, they include objects that stand for anything they want. So hence why it's all pretend play. Pretend, yeah. So one thing that we would look at is their context. So children have a storyline based on real experiences, especially the younger kids. Um, so that's why in dramatic play, we so often see them doing things like, let's play house, let's play doctor, let's play school, because those are experiences that many of them are starting to have and it's things that they feel confident that they can act them out in their pretend play scenario. Now as they get older and later on they're going to start to create pretend play that's less realistic. So it could be things that aren't even experiences they've had and one of the classic ones I could share and I'm thinking a lot of you probably did this was if you ever did the pretend play where the floor is lava oh my gosh get off of the floor it's going to burn you and then all of a sudden your couch cushions are getting ripped off and thrown all over the floor and you're trying to jump from cushion to cushion to cushion and then you have a blanket and you're like tossing it over to the next person and trying to pull them over on the blanket through the lava and oh my gosh but here's the reality how many of you have actually been in horrific lava situations like that <laughs> because I've never been, but I distinctly remember playing the floor is lava. I think that's just one of those rites of passage. A lot of kids play that pretend play scenario. So, but that's just an example of when it's, it's less realistic because not many kids would have experienced a lava true life experience. Second thing we'd be looking at is their roles. So they're themselves or someone similar to them. So we would see them playing like, well, I'm me, I'm so-and-so in this situation. Um, 
I'm my teddy bear. I'm my dolly. They're, they're going to represent themselves with things that, that they're familiar with. And then the older they get later on, they're going to start taking on roles of adults or even animals. So that's why when they're in dramatic play, now we see them start to say, well, you're the doctor, I'm the patient. You're the teacher, I'm the student. You're the mommy, I'm the grandpa or whatever else it might be. And then we see them act out animals. So they might be puppies, they might be kitties, they might be Oh my gosh, in my house lately, it's been black panthers and cougars and like cheetahs. And there was a wild Kratz episode on not too long ago that had all these wild cats that they were exploring. And so my girls just, they gravitated towards that. So that's what they've been role playing lately is these ideas of like wild cats, like, ah, so, so yeah, those would be some things that we notice with roles. All right. Pretend play in regard to number of actions. Usually pretend play starts off as just one action or very few actions that just get repeated over and over and over again. So that's why we would see kids where it's, I wake up, I go to school, I come home, I go to sleep. I wake up, I go to school, I come home, I go to sleep. I wake up, I go to work, I come home, I go to sleep. Um, it could even be, I'm the baby and I wake up, wah, 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 give me a bottle, bottle, okay, okay, now I go back to sleep again. Okay, now I wake up. Wah, 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 wah. I want a bottle. And then they go to sleep again. So it's very repetitive. Um, but then later on, what we notice is that they're starting to have a sequence of actions where it gets a little bit more elaborate. And it's like step one, we're doing this. Step two, we're doing this. Step three, we're doing this. Step four, we're doing this. Step five, we're doing this. And they just keep building on it. And then there's times where they'll go back and start repeating all of that's, those steps too. But it, it's definitely a lot more noticeable that there's more actions taking place than what there would have been when they were maybe a little bit younger. And then involvement, what we're noticing is that they're usually pretend playing on their own to start. Um... That's very common with ages and stages. They they just they do just solitary play. They're just on their own. That's what they do. And then eventually, as they get more comfortable with play, then they'll start to invite others into their play situations. Um, so we can see with this picture with these three children, they're obviously doing group pretend play. And there might be times where they're trying to get adults involved. And I'm pretty sure some of you have probably had children come up to you and say, play with me, play with me. Um, because they're realizing that this idea of community play, it's pretty fun, like being in a group and there's all these other ideas. It's not just their own ideas anymore. It's like this whole, whole mix of ideas from everybody's brains. And that's pretty exciting. Okay, so this I'm just going to show you really quick. I have a YouTube link here that is two children who are doing some pretend play. And at the end of this slideshow, I'm going to have you go back and watch that because I'll have some follow-up questions for you tomorrow. Okay, other things that we notice about preschoolers with their drawing in regards to cognitive stuff. Um, we start to notice that they're no longer scribbling for the sake of scribbling. They're actually trying to draw things and again, it's not going to be perfect, but they are trying to draw things that depict and represent things that they're experiencing in the world. Um, what's very interesting is that preschoolers tend to just go for it and they'll draw a picture. And then after the fact, when the picture is done, then they'll decide what their picture represents. And they might stick with the same story, but they might change it up too. Oh, my picture is this. Oh, wait a second. My picture is this. Oh, wait a second. My picture is this. And that's totally fine. That's very, very common with ages and stages with preschoolers. Language with preschoolers, it's difficult. Um, what we have to remember is that when kids are born, they're born into a world where language is already established and they have to learn it, all of it or at least quite a bit of it in order to get by. Um, and let's be real, English is not one of the easiest languages to learn. So for kids to have to learn the language, yeah, it's gonna take time and it's gonna be difficult and we just have to help them through it and we have to have strategies ready to go um, if they're needing our help. So memory is another thing that we're noticing with preschoolers in that their brain is able to remember more and retain more as far as memories go. So we're starting to see kids in this age group where 
they're retelling, oh yeah, remember when this happened? Oh yeah, remember when this happened? Um, great example, my one daughter, and <laughs> this is kind of gross, so I'm sorry, but my one daughter clearly remembers plain as day the morning that she woke up and she was sick and she puked all over me, like all over me. Like I had to change all of my clothes. I had to clean up a big mess on the floor. And she distinctly remembers that moment in time where she just puked all over me. And so what's funny about that is that anytime someone is sick and they're feeling a little queasy, it automatically triggers in her brain. Oh yeah, mommy, remember that time when I got sick all over you? Yep, I sure do. That's a hard one to forget for myself too. <laughs> but it's just, it's things that they remember. They'll start to pull them out whenever they think it relates to the situation around them. All right. So what preschoolers are learning? Um, things that we know with preschoolers is that they're going to pay attention to physical attributes. They're going to pick out the pieces. Um, so with that said, three to four year olds in particular, they pay attention to things like color and shape. Okay. And then five year olds, they might stick more with just the shapes. Um, but why is this important? Okay. Well, it's important because what's, what's very different is that let's say you and I look at the picture of the zebra and we're noticing the stripes. We're noticing the, the spiky hair on the back of its neck. We're noticing the ears, the eyes, the nose, the face, the sizes of the stripes, like the different colors of them. Some of you are noticing the background that there's green and it looks like there might be some like tree limbs in the back or something like that. We start to take in all of these parts to create a whole picture. But for a preschooler, they're not seeing the whole picture yet. What they might instead notice, and I have it as an example here, look at the ears. They look kind of egg shaped and they're very fuzzy. And then that's what they focus in on. They're not seeing all the other stuff yet that's going on in the picture. So that's really fascinating how their brain looks at a picture compared to how we look at the picture. So it's good for us to notice that, yeah, there's going to be some differences. Other things that we know with preschoolers and the way their, their brains are processing is that they're going to try to make sense of things in ways that makes sense for them. And it might not necessarily make sense to us. And that's totally okay. Because again, kids are trying to figure out the world around them. And they're going to do that in ways that they're comfortable with in ways that they, they just make sense to them. So I'm going to pick on thunder, because thunder is always a big conversation spark for a lot of preschool kids. So Here's the thing. If I try to sit with preschool children and explain to them scientifically, this is the reason why thunder happens, it's going way over their head. It's just too much for them to process. So instead, they're going to take an event like thunder and they're going to try to reason it in ways that they're able to. So some of the things that we would see them do, one would be animism, where they're giving living qualities to inanimate objects. So the example here would be, the bike was mad at me and made me fall. Okay, well how does that relate to thunder then? Okay, well the sky was mad, so it's yelling. Well, that's a living quality to clouds. Okay. So yeah, that's how they're trying to make sense of the thunder then. Artificialism is when they believe everything is made by a real or imaginary person. Everything is made by somebody, whether real or not. So the example here is the sun was rolled into a ball by giants. Okay, well, I'm going to take that idea of giants. And what if I'm talking about thunder and I say, the giants are bowling up in the clouds and they keep dropping the bowling ball. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, that's artificialism. That's how they're making sense of the thunder then. Okay. And then we have finalism where everything has an identifiable and understandable purpose. So <coughs> the ball rolled away. So I would have to chase it. Okay. Well, let's relate it back to thunder. Well, the sky was sad and so it had to boom so that it would cry because if it didn't boom, it wouldn't cry. 
So that's why there's thunder because the sky had to cry. So it's very finite. Like the rain happened because the sky had to let it happen and the thunder made it possible. Finite. Boom. There's their explanation. So again, what they might be explaining isn't necessarily fact and truth, but in their minds, that's how they're trying to process to make sense of it. And I'm pretty sure if you start thinking, even with just the thunder thing, I'm pretty sure some of you had similar ways of processing through something like thunder. Um, like I remember one that I always, always taught was that, yeah, there are people bowling up in the sky and that's why it's always so noisy. So it's just things that kind of get passed down and kids just pick up on it. Okay, and then understanding physical knowledge, so how we can help them. Um, something we need to remember is that simply telling a preschooler about the world around them is difficult and usually ineffective. So it, it just gets to be too overwhelming for them. It's too much information. Their brain can't process through it. And a lot of the stuff, they just simply don't understand it. So it's really important that we keep explanations simple. We keep it to vocabulary that they understand. We keep our explanations very short and concrete. And we don't dig into all of the, oh, this is the reason why. This is the reason why. Why? Why? No, no, no. no. We, we don't do that until they're ready for it. Um, and then we definitely need to allow them time to experiment with objects and events that they can observe. So we want to give them the freedom to explore and to do free play. And remember, we talked about that, that the majority of a child's day should be spent free exploration and playing because that's how they're making sense of the world around them. They they have to have those moments to just like experience it for themselves and, tr and try to make sense of it for themselves. Um, so yeah. That's, that's some things that we can do. And as far as like, why keep this stuff simple? Well, think about it. They're three to five years old. Their brain's not ready for a lot of stuff, nor should their brain have to know everything when they're three to five. They have hopefully so many more years of their life where they can learn all of this knowledge and it can be presented to them at the ages when it would be most appropriate. So the fact is, they're going to learn this stuff at some point. It just doesn't have to all be when they're three to five. Hence why we keep it basic, okay? <coughs> so that is our notes for today. That's where we're going to stop. So here's where I'm going to set you loose on your work. So first thing, I need you to go back to that video. So again, if I go back up into the slides... So this is the video that's linked in Canvas. I want you to watch their pretend play, and then tomorrow I'm going to have some follow-up questions for you. And then your last item on the agenda is I want you to look at this picture of buttons. Okay, so lots of different buttons. And I want you to think of how many different ways you can come up with for sorting and classifying all of those buttons. And I'm hoping you're going to come up with way more than one idea for how you can sort and classify those buttons. So I want you to just jot down those ideas, whatever it is that you have. And then we'll also talk about those um, when we start our class tomorrow. So that's what I got for you. If you feel like you understand what we're doing, great. You can log off to work on your stuff. If you have questions, feel free to stay logged on. You can unmic yourself to ask questions. You can ask them in the chat. You can send me an email with your questions, but we'll definitely make sure we get those taken care of. So that is your agenda for today. Watch that video and figure out how to sort those buttons.